Justice Madsen. Okay. Okay, hello. We are interviewing Justice Barbara Madsen, um, who is running for re-election as Washington Supreme Court Justice. Uh, feel free to give us a one minute, or sorry, a two minute introduction, and then we'll get into some prepared questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I was originally, originally elected, elected to, to the court in 1992, and I had no, I had no idea, idea that I was going, going to be on the Supreme, Supreme court, court, court in my lifetime. In my lifetime but, but what happened but was that Clarence that Thomas, Thomas was, appointed was appointed to the U.S. Supreme, Supreme court, court, and, and when I listened to the testimony of Anita Hill, I realized how much we had in common. As a young attorney, um, young female attorney, I faced similar sexual harassment and I thought, this is not right. It would not happen if there were women in the room. And so I decided that um, in my own profession, the decision making was made by our Supreme Court and um, we needed a woman at the table. So I ran for the court and I have run uh, successfully uh, four additional times. The reason I joined the court, of course, was because I wanted to make a difference for um, people who didn't have a voice. And at that time, from my perspective, it was women. What I've learned since then uh, over the last 30 years is that women, uh, people of color, people who, with disabilities, people with mental health problems, uh, people who have different sexual orientation, none of us really have a voice. Um, and so it's been my goal and um, the challenge that I've given myself to do everything in my power to try to give a voice to people who have an expectation that they'll receive justice in the justice system uh, and make that a reality rather than just an expectation. Um, as a result of my commitment, I have chaired the Gender and Justice Commission for the last 20 years. After leaving the commission, uh, the chair of the commission, I became the chief justice and I started a forum for race in the criminal justice system to explore Ten seconds. why we have the disproportionalities that we have in our uh, justice system uh, based on race. Uh, we have since 2012 had uh, yearly summits where we tackle uh, big problems and try to find great solutions. And that's time. Uh, since then, uh, uh, since not being chief now, I've taken over the Commission on Children in Foster Care. And again, I found racial disproportionality is and that's the biggest time. issue facing you, our foster you care. Time. Thank okay. you. And so I will uh, conclude with saying that I continue with my original commitment to give people a voice in our justice system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. We're going to move on to the first prepared question, and I'll take that one. Um, first question is, what are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? Uh, what is your experience serving as a judge or justice pro tem or within the judicial system, and how will this inform your perspective on the bench? I began my judicial career in Seattle. The first, uh, first position I was given was uh, as a commissioner, and that was a choice by the judges of the municipal court. They um, made a decision to appoint me. Following my appointment as commissioner, I served for two years, and then I was appointed by Mayor Charles Royer to uh, sit on the bench as a, an elected judge. I spent four years, uh, of my four years, I spent two of those as the chief judge, and that was, again, um, an election by my colleagues. Uh, following that, I, as I told you my story, um, in 1992, I decided to make a run for the Supreme Court, and I was successful, and my 30 years on the bench have given me great insight into the challenges and um, many, frankly, solutions that can be implemented to improve our justice system. I'm committed to that. I have, uh, in all of my extracurricular activities, uh, I have demonstrated that I can uh, think outside the box, uh, I can uh, provide leadership, and that I have the compassion and interest in justice that will, um, I think, well serve the citizens of Washington. Great, thank you so much. Uh, our second prepared question, Alice, you wanna take that one? Absolutely. How, how would you further equity and justice for all as a justice? Sorry, I'm gonna start over. How would you further equity and access to justice for all as a justice 
Uh, please provide specific examples of how you have furthered equity and access in your work and judicial decisions. When I joined the court in 1992, there was no, no such thing as our access to justice board, our commission on children in foster care, our minority injustice commission, our gender injustice commission, or our interpreter commission. All of those things were a part, uh, I was a part of um, innovating and making a reality. And all of those efforts are aimed at um, uh, bringing down barriers to our justice system and providing access to the courts and access to hopefully what we are making a more just system with every decision that we make. Uh, specific, um, there are so many specifics. Um, I think one of the most important things I've done is to um, work to educate our trial court judges. It's important for them to understand the people who are appearing in front of them don't come from the same background oftentimes uh, that they have come from. And teaching them about the realities that people are coming from is gonna make all of our judges better judges and be more attuned to the experiences and the needs of the people who use our courts. Um, as I mentioned before, I started the summits on race in the criminal justice system as just one example of a creative solution that I think has really uh, made a difference in making justice a reality for the people that we serve. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a third prepared question. Clayton, do you want to take that one? Clayton, Clayton, you're, you're, on mute. you're on mute. How would you define restorative justice? To what extent are you committed to incorporating principles of restorative justice in your judicial philosophy and decisions? Uh, restorative justice, I think, is um, a, an approach that says the community has a role to play in rehabilitating people's relationships, uh, whether it be in the criminal system or whether it be, uh, for example, in um, uh, domestic relations cases, in our foster care cases, dependency, there's a role for our, our whole community to play. We can't really change the dynamics from the bench. We can provide uh, resources, we can um, provide some pathways, but in the end, it's really restoring people to their position in society. I think it's very important. And I think um, what we have demonstrated since I've joined the court is a commitment to specialty courts as one way of involving the full community. Specialty courts um, are an attempt to bring that person in front of the court back into some kind of harmony with their community, whether it be a drug court um, or a veterans court. Uh, or a drug court. Um, these are all specialty courts where we collaborate with people from the community. They may be care providers. Um, they may uh, be other resources that, that, that we deem the person would benefit from. We bring them back uh, together uh, on a pretty frequent basis, sometimes even weekly, um, to uh, collaborate on solutions for the person in front of us. I think that's probably the closest that courts have come to, to uh, restorative justice. But as commission, as chair of the gender, or excuse me, the uh, uh, Children and Foster Care Commission, we are also um, using that approach of restorative justice by advocating actually quite Ten a few seconds. changes in the legislature this last um, legislative session where we offer resources to families so that families can continue to be uh, the primary place that children uh, are raised, not taking them out of their homes, not uh, introducing the trauma of separation, but providing community resources that will, um, again, rehabilitate the family such that they can be uh, a, a, an appropriate functioning family that protects uh, and nurtures their children. So these and are just a couple time. of examples that's of, time. Uh, that I have worked on. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a fourth prepared question and uh, wondering if Barbara can take that one. I'm happy to, thank you. Um, please provide an example of how you balance the judicial principle of, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, star, stare decisis and 
or adherence to precedent with a rapidly changing society and advancements in racial, economic, social, and climate justice in your judicial decision making? It's interesting um, that uh, that's, that's always a challenge. And um, I think that stare decisis is intended to give stability to the law, but sometimes the law really needs to change. And uh, one way that I personally and, and my court uh, generally has taken um, to, to try to look at the needs that we are currently facing in our society is to look at our own state constitution. And most recently, I've had an opportunity to write um, at least two decisions um, that drew on our state constitution to ensure that, um, well, if I give you the case, if I tell you about the cases briefly, it hopefully will help. One case was uh, Woods versus um, the Union Gospel Mission. It went up to the US Supreme Court recently, and fortunately they denied review but the legislature had provided for an exemption from the anti-discrimination laws, uh, specifically um, for religious uh, organizations. And a person tried to become an attorney for the Union Gospel Mission and he was uh, turned away because he was a same sex, um, uh, he had a same sex partner and he had a sexual orientation that was what the church was not willing to accept. So he was not hired and he brought a lawsuit and I ended up using our state constitution as a way to look at whether or not there was a um, due process violation in granting an exemption for religious organizations to the anti-discrimination laws. And I, um, in using the state constitution was able to say that there is a very limited exclusion from the requirement to um, follow the anti-discrimination laws and that, is, and that is because about 40% of social services in this country are offered through religious organizations. And we cannot allow uh, religious organizations to discriminate in violation of our state anti-discrimination laws. So our state constitution was our solution. Thank Perfect. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Great answer. Thank you. Um, we're gonna ask you a few prepared questions. Uh, from our e-board and um, does anybody from the e-board have any questions they'd like to ask Justice Madsen? Oh, I have a, I have a question also. I wanted to clarify that these are non-prepared questions um, and that the answers to these are one minute each. Um, you, it sounded like you had a second case that you might wanna talk about in that last example. It, I'd give you another minute to, to cover that if you'd like to. Thanks, that's the uh, Cuevas, or Martinez Cuevas case, and it involves the Reuters uh, milk farm, dairy farm. And uh, our state laws have prevented uh, farm workers from getting overtime pay. And so using our state constitution, I found a provision in, that con in our constitution that requires protection for people who are engaged in dangerous occupations. And it turns out that dairy farming is a dangerous occupation. And so using our state constitution, we wrote, I wrote and the court agreed um, to strike down the provision that denied overtime pay for farm workers based on our constitutional protections for people who work in uh, dangerous professions. And so that was a second example of using our own state constitution to right a wrong that um, had persisted for, I want to say, at least 60 to 70 years since we adopted our um, uh, labor and industries laws around overtime pay. Thanks. Uh, other questions? I've got another one, um, if I can. OK. Um, what do you see as the Supreme Court's role in providing in sort of as a, like a leadership role um, among other courts in the state and among generally the, the, um, our system of justice? We have a decentralized court system, which is a, a big challenge. And that means that each uh, jurisdiction gets to set many of its own practices and procedures. Uh, but it also means that they're locally resourced, which means that if we were to mandate everyone have a specialty court, for example, everybody has to have a veterans court, 
the state legislature is not willing to pay for that and it has to come from local funding. So there is a challenge. But, to, but having said that, um, we try to use the uh, position of the court to influence the other jurisdictions, the, um, uh, the trial court at both levels, um, superior and district. We do that in a number of ways. And most recently, we did it through a, a year long commission on, or consortium, I should say, consortium on addressing seconds. racial injustices in our courts. We just published last week our um, findings and, uh, and uh, recommendations, and we are taking that to all of the courts in the state and asking them to implement those uh, solutions. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Uh, I, have a, I have a question. This is Barbara. Um, so I'm going to just take, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a um, kind of a, 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 a flyer of a question. I, I'd like to ask you if you could share with us what your reaction was to the leaked um, opinion from the Supreme Court about Roe v. Wade yesterday and how you think that might come before the Washington uh, Supreme Court in any way. I'm, uh, I'd just like to hear you talk about that a little bit and, uh, and anything that it might help us know about you and um, endorsing you. I, I hate to confess ignorance, but I'm not sure what the leak was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you tell me? Yes, um, an opinion was leaked. Uh, Alice, can you uh, help me? An opinion was leaked uh, by the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade yesterday. It's an Alito majority opinion, um, and oh. the court has confirmed that it's so, uh, legitimate. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, well, if you, I, I'm going to withdraw the question because you, um, I, you know, you're, you're. Uh, it's not fair to me uh, to ask if you have been been thinking about it for 24 hours, like a, you know, like um, <laughs> the folks rest who of us managed to get it on the news. I, so I re I withdraw the question. Anybody else? Well, I I would I would be willing to to tell you sort of generally what we've done when the Supreme Court has gone a different Please. direction. Um, we have looked to our own state constitution. And so we have found protections for our citizens and our residents uh, that the Supreme Court has not found in the US uh, constitution. And so we've done that in the context of religion. Uh, we've done that in the context of our due process uh, clause. And I think that's, um, if, if we felt that um, our constitution gave greater protections to our citizens or our residents, we would not hesitate to use our own constitution to, um, to provide those protections. Thank you very much. That's what Governor Inslee said, by the way. <laughs> oh, did he? <laughs> <laughs> well, there so, you go. <laughs> so we've got time for maybe one more question. Uh, Clayton? Um, it's kind of follow up on Barbara's question, I think. Um, uh, it's been stunning to me uh, down through the ages, that missing from all of the hysteria about the abortion question has been uh, intelligent commentary on the meaning of privacy in a marriage. In that, in that the people who are in favor of restricting abortion are people who would invade uh, the sanctity of a marriage and tell and bring a sheriff in to tell people what they should do at the kitchen table when they are deciding to carry a child or not. So I'm I would just like your your comment on that on that perspective. Well, I, um, I find it concerning that the Supreme Court would um, change directions in the Roe versus Wade uh, analysis 
because it really centers, uh, there's other cases that center on that same analysis, including gay marriage. Um, and if yeah. you remember the genesis of the uh, gay marriage, it started out as the privacy rights of a couple in their own home. And it didn't have to do with marriage. It had to do with laws against sodomy. And the laws against sodomy were being enforced in the privacy of a person's home. And so the first decision that really uh, led to, finally to the marriage um, decision was a, an opinion from our US Supreme Ten Court seconds. that said, you have a privacy right in your own home. And so I'm a little worried that the basis for uh, our uh, marriage decision is, is that privacy right. And if they're rejecting it in Roe versus Wade, I'm a little worried that um, the Supreme Court is going to reject entirely the notion that privacy has any place in our uh, US Constitution. And I find that disturbing, but I think that's, that's what I see um, happening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wondering if you have a one minute closing statement you'd like to make. Um, you, thank you for letting me talk about my cases that I love, love to talk about. Um, I really um, love this job because it is so uh, challenging and exhilarating and important and impacting. Um, and yet, um, I can only do that job if I am returned by the voters and it is their choice. And I um, know that in order for the public to feel the confidence that they need in me, they need to hear from opinion makers in their communities. And I see you as opinion makers and I um, very much uh, uh, desire and hope that you will uh, endorse me and give that, um, that blessing, if you will, uh, to the people who listen to you. Uh, and if you do, I will be uh, very grateful. If you find uh, that I'm lacking, I, uh, I am sorry, <laughs> but um, I do hope for your endorsement and I appreciate so much the time that you've taken tonight. Well, we very much appreciate that and sorry about the, um, you know, the technical issues, but we got through it and did it okay and you did great. So thank